Hello, welcome to Forest Learn. In this video, I'm going to talk about a type of electromagnetic induction that I call cutting field lines. This video is part of a series of videos on EM induction. As I explained in our intro to induction video, I've split the topic of induction up into three different types. And in this video, we're going to get started with type one, cutting field lines. Cutting field lines is just the name I've chosen to give to a particular type of induction. And if you're already familiar with induction, you can probably see why I've chosen this name. Before we get down to the physics, let me just point out that it's a good idea for you to take your own notes while you follow this video. That's a more active learning process than just watching and listening, which can be a bit passive. Also, I'll be posing a couple of small questions here and there throughout this video, just to keep you on your toes and to keep the video interactive. So. Consider a uniform magnetic field directed horizontally from left to right, from a magnetic north pole to a south pole. The field lines are shown in black. Now, imagine we now place a conducting wire in the field at right angles to the field lines. Next, picture the wire being moved up vertically as a whole, something like this. This movement results in the wire cutting across the field lines. Something pretty interesting happens as a result of this. There are of course many free or conduction electrons in the wire, electrons that are free to move. Let's focus in on a single such electron. As the wire as a whole moves up, so does this electron. Since the electron moves up, we can say that there is a current downwards. This is just like in an electric circuit. The flow of electrons is opposite to the direction of current or what's known as conventional current. Now, since this current is directed vertically down, its direction is therefore at 90 degrees to the horizontal magnetic field lines. Fleming's left-hand rule thus tells us that the electron will experience a force. Can you figure out the direction of the force on the electron? Pause the video and please have a think about this yourself. When you're done, unpause the video and we'll discuss the solution. Okay, hopefully what you found is that the electron will experience a force in this direction, sort of towards us. Make sure that you can confirm this. Pointing your first finger on your left hand to the right and your second finger down, you should find that your thumb, which represents the force, points in the direction shown. Everything that we've said about this particular electron that we've been focusing on holds true for all the other conduction electrons moving within the magnetic field. All the electrons experience a magnetic force which results in one end of the wire becoming negatively charged as electrons accumulate there and the other end becoming positively charged as electrons move away from it. So what we've ended up with is something akin to a battery. A battery has positively and negatively charged ends or terminals just like the wire does now. And if we were to connect a filament lamp across the ends of the wire, we may even be able to get it glowing. The black arrows drawn in show the direction in which conventional current would flow. Electrons would flow in the opposite direction. What we can say is that the upward motion of the wire as it cuts across the magnetic field lines gives rise to an electromotive force or EMF within the wire. In other words, the motion has induced an EMF, which in turn induces a current in a closed circuit. This is one type of electromagnetic induction, what I've called cutting field lines, and which is what this video is all about. The induced EMF depends on three factors, as shown in the diagram, B, V, and L. B stands for the magnetic flux density of the uniform magnetic field, and the units of flux density is the Tesla, capital T, L is the length of the wire that's in the magnetic field, and V is the speed of the wire. And the induced EMF is simply given by the product of these three factors, B times L times V. And induced EMF, just like EMF that you've met previously in your studies of electricity, is measured in volts. The induced EMF is a potential difference here. The induced EMF is proportional to each of these three quantities, B, L, and V. For example, if the speed of the wire doubles, the induced EMF will double as well. If the wire were to suddenly stop moving, so if V were to be zero, then the induced EMF would disappear. By the way, the letter we use for the induced EMF, this curly looking E, 
is the Greek letter epsilon. This formula is known as Faraday's law after Michael Faraday, who did pioneering work on electromagnetic induction. Strictly speaking, this is just one form or case of Faraday's law. We'll meet another form of Faraday's law when we discuss other types of induction in follow-up videos. It's not too difficult to prove Faraday's law, and you can see how this comes about by trying a one-mark question after finishing watching this video. Now here's a question for you. Imagine that the wire were moved parallel to the magnetic field lines as shown, instead of moving up. Pause the video and have a think about what, if anything, would happen as a result. When you're done, unpause the video and we'll discuss what happens. Okay, welcome back. The answer is that nothing would happen. There would be no induced EMF. If the wire moves parallel to the magnetic field lines, then the electrons in the wire will of course do so as well. But hopefully, you remember that when an electric charge moves along or parallel to a magnetic field line, it experiences zero magnetic force. Since the electrons don't experience a magnetic force, positive and negative charges don't develop at the ends of the wire, and so there's no induced EMF. Now you may be wondering about Faraday's law. B, L, and V are all finite. None of them are zero. So how comes we're saying that the induced EMF is zero? What you need to remember is that Faraday's law is only valid when both the length and velocity of the wire are perpendicular to the field lines of a uniform magnetic field. In other words, to be able to use Faraday's law, we need a situation like the original scenario, where the field lines are horizontal, the wire is at 90 degrees to the field lines and is moving up, meaning that its velocity is perpendicular to the field lines as well. On the other hand, in the situation we were just looking at, even though the wire is again perpendicular to the field lines, its motion, its velocity is now parallel to the field lines. This means that Faraday's law is invalid here. It can't be used. So even though B, L, and V are non-zero, we just can't use Faraday's law. And so the induced EMF, as we just discussed a moment or two ago, is zero. To stress an earlier point, remember that the Y actually needs to cut across the magnetic field lines in order for an EMF to be induced across the ends of the wire. At this point, if you've already studied a bit of induction, you might be wondering how comes the concept of magnetic flux and flux changes hasn't been mentioned at all. Recall that at the beginning of the video, I pointed out that in this series of videos on induction, I've broken the topic up into three different types of induction. It's types two and three, which are to do with magnetic flux and changes in flux. Type one, the cutting of field lines, which is of course what we've been discussing in this video, doesn't have anything to do with changes in magnetic flux. This is an important conceptual point. Despite what is often suggested, EM induction isn't always about changes in magnetic flux. As I said, I'm pointing this out mainly for the benefit of anyone who's already studied a fair bit of induction. If you're new to induction, don't worry about this right now. Just try to keep it in mind as you go on learning about induction. Now it's pretty awesome that we can get a current to flow in a circuit and light up a bulb just by getting a wire to cut across magnetic field lines. The bulb would of course emit energy in the form of visible light, and would also warm up, thereby increasing its thermal energy store as well. So the question is, where would all this energy come from? It almost seems too good to be true, that just by moving a wire through a magnetic field, cutting through the field lines, we're able to light up a bulb. We'll discuss what's going on in terms of energy in the next video in this series of videos on induction. And we'll also in that video discuss other key concepts in the topic of induction. If you found this video useful, please like it, Share it, subscribe to the Forest Learn channel if you haven't already, and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you soon.